The next time somebody asks you, is it the witches who are responsible for Macbeth's fall? You tell that person this line. Open locks, whoever knocks. It was Macbeth who had decided to come and meet them this time, who had knocked. And when he has knocked, then he has to take the responsibility of his own fall. Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. We are studying Macbeth together and we will be doing the first scene of fourth act today. In this scene, we will see Macbeth meeting the witches again to understand more about his future. But ironically, the witches make him more confused than ever. Stay with me till the end of this video because this scene is very important to understand the eventual fall of our great hero, Macbeth. As the scene begins, we see the witches speaking to each other in their special rhymed coded language. They are preparing some sort of potion or magic liquid which they are going to offer to Macbeth. Thrice the branded cat hath mewed, thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Harpier cries, it's time, it's time. Round about the cauldron go, in the poison entrail throw. So they are throwing ingredients into a cauldron. Cauldron is a big vessel in which things are cooked. So they are cooking something. And what are the ingredients they are cooking with? Toad that under cold stone, days and nights are 31, sweltered venom, sleeping got, boil thou first in the charmed pot. So they are putting in a toad which had become poisonous, sweltered venom over time. And then all of them speak together as if to build a charm. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron bubble. So you notice the trochaic beats rhythm, which is almost similar to the beats of drums that the soldiers play. So are these witches preparing some weapon of destruction for Macbeth? Let's see what else they put. Fillet of a fenny snake. In the cauldron boil and bake, eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm sting, lizard's leg and howlet's wing, for a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble. So, again, these are not appetizing at all. This frog, tongue of dog, and this adder, which is a snake. Um, so they are putting all disgusting things here and again repetition double double toil and trouble fire burn and cauldron bubble scale of dragon tooth of wolf which is mummy maw and gulf so they are increasing this level of disgust when they are promoting themselves to which is mummy Mummy means that, you know, preserved body, probably decomposing. Of the raven, salt, sea, shark, root of hemlock. Hemlock is a poisonous uh, plant. Dicked in the dark. Liver of blaspheming Jew. Gall of goat and slips of ewe. So, these are all poisonous things, you know. This ewe plant is supposed to be poisonous. So they are putting not benevolent or beneficial things, but very dangerous stuff here. Slivered in the moon's eclipse, nose of Turk and Tartar's lips. From where are they getting these ingredients? Well, they are witches and they can get these magical ingredients from all over the world. Finger of birth strangled babe, ditch delivered by a drab, by a woman who as a prostitute. So the things that they are using do not just represent venomous or harmful things, but they also represent moral corruption, 
and human misery. Nick the gruel, thick and slab, and there too a tiger's chodron, for the ingredients of our cauldron. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron bubble. So I'm not explaining the meanings of all the ingredients they're putting in. You can look them up yourselves. But the point is they are putting in a lot of hatred. They are putting in a lot of disgust here. And finally, to top it all, cool it with a baboon's blood, then the charm is firm and good. And now he kit that head witch or the head of the witches she enters oh well done i commend your pains and every one shall share in the gains and now about the cauldron sing like elves and fairies in a ring and chanting all that you put in so they start singing this song black spirits and everything uh, hecate goes away and the three other witches too the second witch she notices something Something is pricking her thumb. She's feeling a sensation. By the pricking of my thumb, something wicked this way comes. So somebody is coming towards them who according to the witches is wicked. So imagine the wickedness of that person. Then she says a very important thing. Open locks whoever knocks. This is the most important important line in the play I am telling you. Whoever knocks means whoever chooses to meet the witches, whoever chooses to walk that path. The lock opens only for them. So next time somebody asks you, is it the witches who are responsible for Macbeth's fall? You tell that person this line. Open locks, whoever knocks. It was Macbeth who had decided to come and meet them this time, who had knocked. And when he has knocked, then he has to take the responsibility of his own fall. Macbeth enters. And look at the way he greets them as if he's meeting his friends here. How now, you secret black and midnight hags? What is it you do? So he notices that these witches, they are cooking something in a cauldron. A deed without a name. I conjure you, I order you, by that which you profess. So in the name of your power, I am asking you, however you come to know it, answer me. I don't care how you know things, you just tell me. Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches, though the yesty waves confound and swallow navigation up, though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down, so no matter what you do, you, you, you do things against the church, I don't care, you drown people in the sea, I don't care. So he has totally lost any consideration for any kind of morality. He doesn't care how the witches gain their information. Though castles topple on their warders' heads, though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations, let these buildings all be broken down, but just give me this information. What information? Though the treasure of nature's Germans stumble all together, even till destruction sicken, answer me to what I ask you. I don't care if the world comes to an end, answer me. He's always very over dramatic with these witches, I see. They are monosyllabic in their replies. Speak, demand, we'll answer. Say, now they are giving him a condition. Say, if thou wouldst rather hear it from our mouths or from our masters. Now Macbeth feels that okay. Uh, these witches are quite powerful, so their masters must be more powerful. So I will obviously listen from these masters if I have the chance. Call them. Let me see them. So it says choice again. The witches, they pour something else into the cauldron. Pour in so's blood. So is an adult female pig that hath eaten her nine pharaoh. Not just any ordinary pig, but a pig who has eaten her own children. Grease, 
that sweaten from the murderer's gibbet. From the gallows where a person is executed, throw into the flame and then they sing their charm. Come high or low, thyself an office deftly show. So now we see an image working itself up in front of Macbeth's eyes and it transfixes him. What image is this? There is thunder. Whenever the witches are there on stage, there is a lot of thunder and lightning. The first apparition, apparition means the image that comes out of that cauldron, the vision that comes out, the spirit that comes out. And it's an armed head. It's a head wearing that armor which a warrior wears. Tell me, thou unknown power. So Macbeth wants to address that head as if that head would listen to him and respond. And the witches, they stop him, that there's no point in talking to him. He knows thy thought. Hear his speech, but say thou not. Don't speak. And what does this apparition tell? Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Beware, Macduff. Beware, the Thane of Fife. Dismiss me enough. And it's gone. So it gives an information that Macbeth should be aware of Macduff, who is the Thane of Fife. Macbeth's reaction. Whatever thou art, for thy good caution, thanks. Thank you for warning me. Thou hast harped my fear all right. So I had this fear in my mind. You have confirmed it. So this apparition, this image has not given Macbeth any new information. It has only strengthened what he had always believed that he should be careful of Macduff. But one word more, so he wants to ask a clarification here. He will not be commanded. Here is another, more potent than the first. So don't worry, we are giving you another apparition, another spirit. Again a thunder. Second apparition comes, a bloody child. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. So that bloody child screams. Had I three years, I'd hear thee. So Macbeth can hear that apparition loud and clear. Be bloody, bold and resolute. Love to scorn the power of man. For none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Quite complicated this one. What is this apparition saying? Saying that Macbeth should laugh at people laugh at powerful people because nobody can harm him who is born of a woman. Now everybody in this world is born of a woman. Macbeth makes a sensible reaction here. Then live Macduff. Then of course if Macduff is a human being and no human being can harm Macbeth then he shouldn't be afraid of Macduff. What need I fear of thee? But See, whenever Macbeth makes any sensible statement, in the next statement he refutes that. But yet I'll make assurance double sure. I won't take any chances. I will put Macduff out of my way, no matter what the second prophecy is, and take a bond of fate. He always talks about bonds of fate when he's killing his friends. Thou shalt not live, that I may tell pale-hearted fear, it lies. So whenever I have fear, I can tell my fear that you are lying because Macduff is dead. So I want to make sure of that and sleep in spite of thunder. We know that lately Macbeth was not able to sleep quite well and he really wants to get a good night's sleep. And he can get that only if Macduff is not there in this world. While he is speaking to himself, thunder and another apparition comes. This time a child crowned, wearing a crown, with a tree in his hand. Now these are all very symbolic. We will come to that. 
Let's just look at what he has to say here. What is this that rises like the issue of a king? Issue means descendant of a king. And wears upon his baby brow the round and top of sovereignty. The crown is the round and top of sovereignty. So this child is wearing a crown. Listen, but speak not to it. So everybody hushes Macbeth. The third apparition says, be lion metalled, be strong as a lion, proud and take no care who shafts, who frets or where conspirers are. Don't, don't consider anything at all. Why? Macbeth shall never vanquished be until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsin in hill shall come against him. Burnham Wood, a forest. That forest would come to Dunsin and Hill, move on the day of Macbeth's death. The point is, the forest cannot move. So this implies for Macbeth a sort of assurance of immortality. And he says, that will never be. Who can impress the forest? Who can order the forest to, you know, lift yourself up and move? Bid the tree unfix his earthbound root. A tree will never unfix its root. Sweet woodman's good. He's calling these spirits who are born out of that disgusting cauldron good and sweet. So here he has completely confused himself as to what is fair and what is foul. For him, the fair has become foul. Fair people like Macduff has become foul. And foul things like these spirits, they have become fair and sweet and good. Rebellious dead, rise never till the wood of Burnham rise. He is warning these rebellious people that don't you dare come against me because I will not be killed. I will not be defeated till the Burnham forest moves to Dunsin in Hill, which is an impossibility. And our high-placed Macbeth shall live the lease of nature. He is calling himself Macbeth. So he is talking like as if he is talking like in a third person here. So he is looking at himself from outside himself. Macbeth shall live the lease of nature, pay his breath to time and mortal custom. So he is happy that he is going to have a big, long, successful life and face a natural death, yet in my heart throbs to know one thing. He still wants to know things, he is not satisfied yet. Tell me, if your art can tell so much, shall Banco's issue ever reign in this kingdom? So will Banco's son be king of Scotland? So everything comes down to Banco's son. It has always come down to that. Obviously, the witches won't answer him directly. Seek to know no more. I will be satisfied. Just tell me this. Deny me this and an eternal curse fall on you. Let me know this. Why sinks that cauldron? And what noise is this? So while he is asking that question desperately, cursing them that if you don't tell me, I'm going to curse you. And then he sees that the cauldron is vanishing in front of his eyes, it's sinking. And then he can hear some noise. The witches give him the final show. Show, show, show. Show his eyes and grieve his heart. Come like shadows, so depart. So they are ordering something to enter and exit. And a parade walks in front of Macbeth's eyes. A show of eight kings. The last with a glass in his hand, a mirror. So if a person is holding a mirror at the end of a line, what will you see? You will see the reflection in that mirror. So that line will kind of look quite longer than it actually is. At the end of the line, it's Banco. So this line represents the line of Banco, the descendants of Banco. Now when Macbeth looks at this line, he first notices the first person entering the stage, the, 
the first person who stands in the beginning of the line is walking in the beginning of the line and he says thou art too like the spirit of banco down thy crown does sear mine eyeballs so the first figure that walks into the stage is wearing a crown and looks like banco so macbeth does not like that scene he does not want banco's son to be the king at all and thy hair thou other gold bound brow is like the first so then he looks at the second person in the line a third is like the former so he again looks at the third person in the line and he sees that they are like photocopies of each other they are like lines of vanco stretching in front of him fill the hags why do you show me this so he is very angry with the witches because he do not, doesn't understand why what this this means and he wants a direct answer and these witches they are showing him some masquerade some show a fourth start eyes so it's as if his eyes are popping out in surprise and shock what will the line stretch out to the crack of doom this line is never ending for him he is traumatized he has forgotten everything about the three prophecies which he had heard which had elevated his mood which had made him feel so good about life and now he is scared by the sight in front of him another yet a seventh i'll see no more so he doesn't want to see any more and yet the eight the peers who bears a glass which shows me many more inside the mirror there is reflection so he can see many more kings and some i see that two fold balls and treble scepter scary so a scepter is representative of a king's power when a king is carrying two scepter it means that king rules over two nations or two kingdoms so banco's issues or descendants not only become kings but they also become powerful kings of multiple territory this is something which macbeth cannot tolerate horrible sight now i see it's true for the blood bolted banco smiles upon me now he notices banco right at the end of the line and points at them for his so banco is pointing at these kings as if to tell macbeth that these are my descendants this is my bloodline and you won't get anything anything after you die i get this what is this so the witches are making quite fun of him hi sir all this is so but why stands macbeth thus amazedly what's wrong with you come sisters cheer we up his spirits and show the best of our delights so these witches are trying to cheer macbeth up i'll charm the air to give a sound while you perform your antic round so they are again in that singing mode that this great king may kindly say our duties did his welcome pay so they are calling him a great king and they want to please him the witches dance and eventually vanish where are they gone let this pernicious hour stand i accursed in the calendar he wants to come and visit the witches he forces them presses them to know more about himself and then he curses the moment it's a strange kind of duality in him it is as if there is one macbeth hurtling down the steps of hell another macbeth looking at that descending figure and cursing that figure in roman polanski's movie the scene is presented in a surrealist manner he has shown that macbeth was offered a drink from that cauldron and after he consumed the contents he started hallucinating and in his hallucination he saw these images this is quite believable interpretation because the way macbeth behaves when he looks at these apparitions is the way an intoxicated person behaves a drugged person behaves macbeth is under a spell and the worst thing is 
he has brought it upon himself. After this episode of witches, we see Lennox entering with a very important information. Macbeth asks him, saw you the weird sisters? No, my lord. Of course, Lennox has not knocked and he has no access to the witches because he has not chosen to meet the witches. No, my lord. Came they not by you? No, indeed, my lord. Infected be the air whereon they ride and damned all those that trust them. He is still trusting them and he curses the person who trusts the witches. I did hear the galloping of horse. Who was it came by? It's two or three, my lord, that bring you word Macduff is fled to England. Fled to England? So he had just had this apparition warning him against Macduff and now he has this news that Macduff had gone away, escaped to England. Hi, my good lord. And Macbeth speaks in an aside. Aside is where he is speaking, but the other person present on stage cannot hear him. Time. Thou anticipatest my dread exploits. Exploit means plans. So he was planning something, but he is not able to do that. The flighty purpose never is overtook unless the deed go with it. So he realizes that any time he has to execute a plan, he has to execute it right then. He cannot wait. From this moment, the very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. Earlier also, he had said that it is not wise to think about action because then it cools the action, it cools the urgency. And now he decides once again that from now, whatever I'll think, I'll do straight away without thinking. And even now, to crown my thoughts with acts, be it thought and done. The castle of Macduff I will surprise. So I will make sure that Macduff's castle is attacked. Seize upon five. I will take control of five. Five is Macduff's territory. Give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. Macduff is not there. But it's not about killing Macduff anymore. It's about destroying Macduff. His family, his children, his relatives, his wife. Is this the sign of a hero? Is this how a hero behaves? Killing defenseless children and women? No boasting like a fool. This deed I'll do before this purpose school. But no more sights. I don't want to see any more visions. So he feels that he is seeing all these visions because he was not able to take control of his life. And now by planning this dreadful thing, he is going to take charge. Where are these gentlemen? Come, bring me where they are. So he wants to go and meet the guys who had brought information that Macduff had fled to England. This Macbeth does not need his wife to do something as heinous as kill children. Act 4 is technically the denouement, the fall. Can he fall any lower or is this the end point? Is this the moment which will help him gain some realization to redeem himself and become heroic, if not in life, but in his death? The next scene is a very cruel one. But be with me in my next class when we will study the second scene of Act 4 and see how low Macbeth can fall. I hope this class was useful to you. If you haven't subscribed, I would really expect you to do that, to share this video with your friends and anybody you know who will benefit from these classes. Thank you all for your love and support. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off. Thanks for being with us.